Well, it wouldn't be 2020 if I didn't have at least one catastrophic video error. So today I'm remaking my Monster Monday about flesh golems. Well, if you're at home following along in your monster manual that you legally purchased, I'm on page 169. The golem section is something that I haven't explored a lot, and I hope to do more videos about golems, but I wanted to start this off with the flesh golem. And the reason for that is because I have a lot of ideas for how to use them, and I have actually used them recently. So I'll share some of those ideas as we explore this interesting opportunity of an encounter. Um, flesh golems, like all the other golems, are constructs, but this construct happens to be made out of body parts. What can be more grisly and fun than your old Frankenstein monster? Um, and I, I like the idea of the flesh golem because it's accessible. It's not super powered. Um, a lot of the other golems are very deadly. But the flesh golem is one that I feel like you can easily scale. And believe it or not, even though it's kind of intended for mid to high level encounters, I feel like you could use a flesh golem with my ideas at even lower levels and make it very interesting and tie it into your overall storylines. So to start off with, let's go over the basics that um, they present in the monster manual about all of the golems. And I kind of already summarized some of those things, but basically, um, Magically, a golem can be made by creating the form, whatever form that uh, takes, and then imbuing it with uh, specific magical, magical powers and tying it to a certain series of rituals um, that involves possession of a manual of golems, which is uh, an item that we'll maybe look into later that can be found in your DM's guide. The flesh golem is a grisly assortment of humanoid body parts stitched and bolted together into a muscled brute imbued with formidable strength. Its brain is capable of simple reason, though its thoughts are no more sophisticated than those of a young child. The golem's muscle tissue responds to the power of lightning, invigorating the creature with vitality and strength. Powerful enchantments protect the golem's skin, deflecting the spells and all but the most potent weapons. A flesh golem lurches with a stiff-jointed gait, as if not in complete control of its body. Its dead flesh isn't an ideal container for an elemental spirit, which sometimes howls incoherently to vent its outrage. If the spirit breaks free of its creator's will, the golem goes berserk, until calmed or until its shell of flesh is destroyed or completely healed. When I think about the flesh golem, I think, well, here's something that's been in D&D since the earliest of days. And I remember the picture from the first Monster Manual, that classic black and white line art. Um, and, and it basically is evocative of the Frankenstein monster, right? The, the creature that is a mashup of other people's body parts. This flesh golem in fifth edition is what I would consider the perfect candidate for scaling. And not just because like any other creature where I've shared my ideas about scaling, having an impact on armor class or hit points or even their attack forms. I think that this actually narratively could be scaled. So the standard flesh golem is a medium construct, medium sized. So presumably when they say that it is a mashup of humanoid body parts, we're talking about medium humanoids. And if you're smart, I think you can see where I'm going with this whole idea of scaling being quite literal. But let's look into the stats and, and some of the specifics of the flesh golem, and then I'll share my ideas with you. So straight out of the book, this is a challenge rating five encounter. Armor class of nine, hit points of 11 D8 plus 44. Now that's significant. The plus 44 means on the lowest end, this guy is beefy. This is, a, this is a kind of hard to kill monster because it's got a lot of hit points. Um, and, and scaling this, you know, the, the suggested average that they have here is hit points of 93. But if you do the math, if you wanted to max out this guy just by the book, you're talking 11 to 8, so 88 
plus another 44. So quick math, 120 something. That's a lot. 132. That's a lot of hit points. Um, speed of 30 feet, so your standard movement speed, um, which, you know, part of me thinks like, well, but they narratively described that the flesh golem moves with like a, a, a lurch and a gait. So maybe, you know, maybe that speed could be adjusted for scaling as well. Uh, strength of 19, constitution of 18, um, a horrifically low six intelligence and five charisma, dex of nine, wisdom of 10. So um, obviously statted towards the actual physical form, right? The flesh golem being very durable, uh, having a high endurance, high constitution, and uh, high strength. Damage immunities. So this is where it gets interesting. Um, lightning, poison, and bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons that aren't adamantine. So a lot of times we see with monsters that they are uh, immune to conventional non-magical weapon attacks. But this is interesting because they're saying that it's uh, non-magical weapon attacks that aren't adamantine. So in theory, if you had weapons made of adamantine that weren't enchanted, they weren't even magical, they were just adamantine, it could do damage against a flesh golem. Condition immunities to being charmed, exhausted, frightened, paralyzed, petrified, or poisoned. That's pretty standard with a construct. Um, dark vision of 60 feet. And then we get into the meat and potatoes of what makes a flesh golem a flesh golem. Berserk. Whenever the golem starts its turn with 40 hit points or fewer, roll a d6. On a six, the golem goes berserk. On each of its turns while berserk, the golem attacks the nearest creature it can see. If no creature is near enough to move to an attack, the golem attacks an object, with preference for an object smaller than itself. Once the golem goes berserk, it continues to do so until it destroys or regains all of its hit points. Until it is destroyed, or it regains all of its hit points. The golem's creator, if within 60 feet of the berserk golem, can try to calm it by speaking firmly and persuasively. The golem must be able to hear its creator, who must take an action to make a DZ-15 charisma persuasion check. If the check succeeds, the golem ceases being berserk. If it takes damage while still at 40 hit points or fewer, the golem might go berserk again. What are the advantages of going berserk? Nothing. We'll get to that in a moment as well. Aversion to fire. So if the, golem attack, uh, if the golem takes fire damage, it has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks until the end of its next turn. Immutable form. The golem is immune to any spell or effect that would alter its form. Lightning absorption. Whenever the golem is subjected to lightning damage, it takes no damage and instead regains a number of hit points equal to the lightning damage dealt. So lightning heals it. Electricity heals it talk about that in a minute as well. Magic resistance. The golem has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. That's huge. Magic weapons. The golem's weapon attacks are magical. Hmm. So for its actions, it has multi-attack. The golem makes two slam attacks. Uh, these are melee weapon attacks, plus seven to hit, reach of five feet, and they do 2d8 plus 4 bludgeoning damage. And remember, it's calculated as magical. So if by some chance a member of the party has some sort of um, magical spell to help out against attacks that aren't magical, these are magical. Where does this leave us? It leaves us with this. By itself, out of the book, the Flesh Golem is awesome. A great opponent to throw into the mix against a mid-level party, for sure. Could you take this Golem? and scale it down, certainly, for a lower level party, yes. How could you do that? Well, the easy ways would be armor class, hit points, weapon attacks, right? Well, the armor class is already nine, so it's not too hard to hit this guy, which means if you wanted to scale it down, you'd have to drop the hit points down. What else could we do? Well, you could make it vulnerable to normal conventional weapon attacks if you wanted to. You could make it um, more vulnerable. Maybe it takes extra damage um, 
when it, when it takes fire damage. Maybe any fire attack is doubled against it. So these are little DM tips that you could tweak to make this kind of scaled for, for lower level encounters. But here's where I think this gets interesting. Let's rewind the clock for a minute and talk about the construct itself. So what if a flesh golem was made not using medium-sized body parts, but small? Suppose that you, you, know, you had a, a person making this flesh golem who was using like halfling and gnome body parts. Now you'd have a small, not medium construct, small construct, which would give you narratively an, an explanation for why this flesh golem might have lower stats. Maybe it's physically smaller. So it physically doesn't do as much weapon damage attack. Maybe physically because it's smaller, it doesn't have as many hit points. So those are just some interesting ways that I've thought like, what if you had this conglomerate that made up the flesh golem that was made of small creature body parts? Plus, it might be kind of terrifying if you know legends and myths were built up around the flesh golem that haunted the ancient manor on the hill outside of town. And then when people actually go there, they find out it's a halfling flesh golem, and they're they're like, ha, and they laugh at it, but then it goes hog, you know, goes ham on them. Um, so a small flesh golem is another way that you can narratively scale down the flesh golem. Now, as we know, things are on a continuum. So you're probably thinking, well, Bill, how are you gonna you know scale this up? Ah. If one could make a flesh golem with small body parts it would then logically present itself as a possibility that one could make a large flesh golem out of large creature body parts. That's right, people. What if you took hill giant body parts or ogre troll body parts? Maybe you mix those things. Now you have a large flesh golem, and that large flesh golem perhaps has a couple more points of armor class but probably has a whole boatload more hit points. And it makes it possible then to have this flesh golem, this large flesh golem construct, be a serious foe for a higher level party. Let's continue with this thread of logic, shall we? Suppose that the innovative spellcasting golem making crazy wizard decided that they were not only gonna use large body parts, but that they were going to mix and match troll body parts, ogre body parts, and hill giant body parts, and that some of that essence related to some of those creatures um, imbued itself into the construct. So maybe some of the regenerative properties of the trolls, for example, could be part of this new large flesh golem. So you wanna scale up your flesh golem for a higher level encounter, give it some regenerative properties. Now, it would still follow that it would be vulnerable, perhaps more so, to fire. So how do you further scale it up? Well, again, toss it more hit points, give it a bigger weapon attack and damage. Ah, oh, but let's re rewind again a moment and take a look at Berserk. Because as this is written, the Berserk function basically just makes the Flesh Golem lose its mind and start smash. Hulk smash, kill, fight, smash. But it doesn't actually mechanically benefit the Golem. But what if it did? What if you threw into the mix for your Uber Golem that the Berserk function worked like Barbarian's Rage? That during the time when it goes Berserk, it now has damage resistance and it takes half damage to everything. Half damage to everything, just berserk, rah, right? And it gives it a boost to any strength-related checks, and it gives it a boost likewise to damage done by its slam attacks. Maybe that, that berserk now gets some rage tossed into it, or maybe it can berserk and rage uh, at will, not just at the roll of a d6 when it's below 40 hit points. Maybe the moment it takes damage for the first time, it can snap into that berserk mode. So all of a sudden, you've created a much more challenging flesh column. It's bigger, it has more hit points, it can rage and do more damage during that. What if, um, what if you took away 
some of its other weaknesses. Perhaps the aversion to fire is gone with the larger, more powerful flesh column. So this again ties back to ways to scale it. But how do we talk about story? Well, all of these ideas that I've just presented have been the seeds of stories. So let's explore each one of them a little more. Let's start off with the small flesh golems. Let's say that an up and coming wizard just got their hands on this manual of golems and is learning the ropes and they, they aren't quite ready to make a big guy. So that what they've been doing is abducting halflings and gnomes and, and doing experiments on them, right? And they are building these prototype, you know, smaller flesh golems while they're learning the craft. But how does this create an adventure? Well, your party's traveling through an area and they hear about these missing halflings and gnomes and how maybe some of these missing halflings and gnomes were like well-known NPCs in the village. Maybe they were shopkeepers or they worked at the inn and they, within the last two weeks, a lot of them have gone missing. This creates an adventure seed now where, where maybe the party wants to find out or you know maybe they need a little nudge and, and the town mayor asks them to find the missing halflings. And this leads them on this chase around the region where they find out that there's an old abandoned you know, manor house where uh, a wealthy family once lived that you know, it, it exploded in a, a, in a fire and people think it's haunted, yada, yada, right? So you tie this young up and coming wizard to that house. Maybe this young up and coming wizard was the youngest member of that family and had been using the attic as a place to do experiments and accidentally in one of their early experiments, you know, caused an explosion which burned down some of the house, right? And maybe the family inside died. That wizard's gone back to their home and they're using their old lab. They've rebuilt things in their old lab and now they've abducted halflings and gnomes and they're doing, you know, experiments to create golems out of them, yada, yada. Well, what's so special about that location? Maybe, Maybe the wizard has some, you know, protector undead. Get creative, you know, maybe, maybe not just skeletons and, and zombies, but maybe some of the other low level undead are kind of in the area. Or maybe, maybe the creator reanimated um, his family members, his deceased family members, and now they are sentinels around the house to keep intruders away. Um, so, so you built up this, this manor house as like the haunted mansion kind of thing, right? Think Frankenstein. Okay, so like now you've got this mad scientist wizard who's, who's learning the ropes of golem making and has successfully made a few prototype golems. And maybe to scale it down for your low level adventurers, maybe some of these guys only have like one arm, you know, so they're, they only get one attack instead of two. So you, you can scale it down and make that scaling down part of the narrative, right? Now, whether or not the party defeats this guy or he gets away, However it works, maybe, maybe he gets away. Maybe you know, he sends his halfling golems, three or four of them to fight the party and, and in combination you know, the party somehow succeeds but the bad guy gets away. But somewhere in that laboratory, he would have had to have had some device that helps him collect electrical energy. You know, imagine describing to your party kind of a, a mad scientist's laboratory with you know, sort of like Tesla coil things and metal rods that are, um, you know, like antenna on top of the roof to collect, you know, lightning from storms and whatnot. And maybe they piece this together as like the, the catalyst which, you know, revivifies and awakens these flesh golems. Or maybe they don't. But you could use that as a thread. Now, how do you tie that low-level uh, adventure into a campaign idea? Well, let's say that guy got away. Now he's going to go you know, build up his resources elsewhere and start doing bigger experiments. And now he's ma making medium-sized golems. Um, and maybe there's something else with that. You know, maybe he's part of a faction or a cult that has a, a bigger interest in what's going on regionally or within the kingdom or across multiple nations. And this cult or faction is kind of building this army up of magical constructs that are going to help them with their insidious plan. What that plan is, I don't know. You, you can make that up. It's, it's all about power anyway, right? 
Now at mid-level, you could have either the same guy or another member of that faction developing flesh golems easily, you know, different setting perhaps. Maybe this time it's in the bowels of a city, you know, in the catacombs underneath an old monastery that's in the city. And, you know, there are other faction cultists that are part of this, and they've been abducting people, you know, particularly people with large physical builds. Now maybe you make it a little more personal. Maybe like a friendly doorman at, a, at an inn where the party regularly goes. You know, a, a big, burly, you know, friendly, gentle, giant kind of guy goes missing. And, and the party's like, hey, where did, you know, Korgak, our friendly half-orc, you know, doorman, bartender, uh, bouncer go, you know, whatever. And, and so they start to get an interest in it because you've made a personal link. That's another way to make it kind of more engaging for the party, to have an interest, to have a vested interest in wanting to find out what's going on. Where are these missing people going? What's happening? Here's another option. At the higher level things, you can have a same or similar kind of setup, but now you have the opposite of missing people. You have missing threats. So maybe there's an area or a region uh, within your gaming world where traditionally there have been a lot of trolls or ogres or hill giants. Maybe some mountain pass where, where trade has to go through because it's the only trade way for miles or between these settlements or these two nations and where traditionally they would have one to two attacks a week from trolls, ogres, or hill giants. They have not had any in several weeks. So the peculiarity, the twist, is that the absence of that threat is there. And so maybe most common folk are just happy that there aren't any raids anymore when you're going through the old pass. But maybe somebody, somebody more esoteric is like, why isn't that happening? What's going on? And maybe you have, you know, this time it's a hired situation. Maybe the regional magistrate hires the party to go find out, like, what is going on in the pass. And then they stumble upon this cave-like network that leads to an old um, temple built into the mountains. And this is actually a base of operations for this faction or this cult. Or for a single operator, if you don't want to tie it to a bigger storyline, just have a more powerful mage who is this mad scientist who's got this elaborate antenna, you know, electricity harvesting setup in this monastery and has made these uber golems that are you know large creatures with more hit points and more damage resistance and rage abilities so i i just love the flesh golem because you can use it at any from levels one to level 20 and really any of these ideas could be applied to any fantasy role-playing game i'm going to go so far as to say that you could put this easily into modern games even like call of cthulhu like monster of the week um, cult, whatever, whatever you play, I'm pretty sure that there's a way to take the flesh golem concept and mold it into an interesting encounter, adventure, or even a whole big overlapping campaign storyline thread. You know, when in doubt, if you're seeking inspiration, there are a whole bunch of movies about Frankenstein-like creatures and shows, great shows, that feature Frankenstein-like constructs. Um, one, you know, one in particular, obviously, is like, go back and read the book. Read, read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I mean, that's, that's where you should start. And then watch movies and TV shows. Um, that could give you additional inspiration. Because I think there's a lot of that out there. Then you could take those ideas from those books, from those movies, from those TV shows, and intertwine them and make them your own. That's synthesis. That's creativity. And as a GM or DM, that's something that you can do to up your game. So thanks for watching as always. Thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing and liking this video and sharing it. And we'll see you on the next Monster Monday.
Hello, it's me, Wizzy. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. And then don't forget to tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and crafting videos and DM tips and pro tips for vlogging and all sorts of gaming things. And also you could watch Bill eat food and watch other shows featuring Bill. He made me say that because he's a narcissist. Okay, bye.